principal, Hari Vidya Peet Mutihari, and I welcome all the students of class 9. Now, today we will do a chapter from the book B5, okay, and the name of the chapter is A Truly Beautiful Mind. A Truly Beautiful Mind from the book B5. Alright? So, first and foremost, you must have this book with you. Alright? So, this is a must. This book should be with you. Okay? Alright. So, now, let's begin. This chapter is based on the life of Albert Einstein. Okay, the great German scientist who gave us the theory of relativity. It is on his life that this chapter is based. So it is a part of his biography. Biography is a life story. Okay, so it is a part of his biography. Now, to begin with, you see, this title, A Truly Beautiful Mind. Now, if you notice closely, I have made this word, truly, bolder than the other words. Okay? I have made the word, truly, bolder than the other words. Now there is a purpose for doing that. And what is the purpose? What is the intention? The title could easily have been a beautiful mind. Whose mind are we talking about? We are talking about Einstein's mind. Okay? So it is a beautiful mind. Meaning that he was a genius. He was a man of remarkable, of exceptional qualities, exceptional talent, and therefore he had a beautiful mind. However, the writer here has added an adverb. Truly is an adverb. Okay? So, he has added an adverb before the adjective. It's not just a beautiful mind, it is a truly beautiful mind. Now what does he mean by that? What does the writer mean by that? Why has he added the word truly before beautiful? Now to answer the question, I would like you to pay attention here. You see, Albert Einstein was a genius. Yes, he was a genius. He was a man of exceptional, of rare mental ability. Okay? But more importantly, he was a humanist. He was a humanist. A humanist is a person who is concerned with the welfare of the people at large. A person who is interested in the welfare, in the good, in the benefit of mankind. So, he was not just a person who was a great inventor, he was also a person who had a heart, who wanted to do all that he could for the Alright, that is why he was a humanist. The word humanist has come from the word human. He was truly a very soft hearted people, a, a person. Alright, so he was a very soft hearted person. He not only invented new theories, alright, he not only gave us certain discoveries, he also had a feeling for the good of the people. Now this feeling, this feeling for 
for the good of the people. You know, he wanted people to prosper. He wanted peace. He wanted democracy to thrive. That is what made him a humanist. That is what distinguishes Albert Einstein from the other great researchers and inventors. Okay? We've had many inventors before Einstein and even after Einstein. However, we've had very few people, we've had very few researchers and inventors who were also humanists. Okay? So he was a humanist. A man who truly defined the term genius. This is very important. He was a man who truly defined the word genius. What does genius mean? As I told you earlier, genius is somebody who has remarkable abilities. Alright? Who has a remarkable mind. He has remarkable talent. Exceptional talent. But the true definition or interpretation of a genius is a person with not only exceptional qualities, exceptional with an exceptional mind, but also a person who has a heart. We all have hearts, but how many of us really think of the benefit of mankind? How many of us really think about how to do good to others? Really? Okay? But he was a person, Einstein was a person who thought about the good of mankind. Alright? So he defined the word genius. He added another dimension to the word genius. Alright, so coming back to the title, you see the significance of the title is that this title defines the true word, the true meaning of the word genius. Okay, now if you go, you look up a dictionary, okay, you see that genius, the word genius will be defined as a person with rare and exceptional talent of exceptional, you know, uh, mental faculty. But it does not tell you anything about what kind of a person a genius should be. It only defines his mental faculty that he should be somebody exceptional when it comes to, you know, his uh, uh, mind power. Okay? So he should be somebody exceptional. However, what kind of a person should he be? So Einstein was a person who was not only uh, the owner of an exceptional mental faculty, he was also a humanist and he also thought about the benefit of mankind. So he did not only have a beautiful mind, all right, which means he did not only possess exceptional qualities or exceptional mental faculty, he also had a wonderful heart. All right, that is the reason he did not only possess a beautiful mind, he possessed a truly beautiful mind. His mind was truly beautiful. We have so many people. We've had so many people before Einstein and after Einstein who had beautiful minds. But Einstein had a truly beautiful mind. Because he was a humanist along with being a great scientist. Is that clear? So that is the significance of the title. This you must remember. That he gave a new dimension 
to the word genius. It's going to be a genius. But how many people really possess a human heart? We all possess a human heart. But a true human heart beats not only for that person, but also for others. Einstein's heart beat for him as much as it beat for other people, for the humanity. Alright? So that's it. Now, you see, this chapter, I hope you have the book and have the chapter open in front of you. Now, this chapter of Beautiful Mind has, if you see, 17 points. Alright? It is given in a pointwise, you know, it's in a pointwise manner. So there are 17 points. Now we will divide this chapter into two parts and we will do the first nine points today and the rest of the eight points the next day. Alright? So, let's begin. Now, coming to this, the first point, he was born on March 14, 1879. And his mother thought he was a freak. Now, let's take it up here from the book. Albert Einstein was born on the 14th of March, 1879 in Germany. Okay, in the German city of Ulm. Without any indication that he was destined for greatness. Destined is planned. Planned from before, pre planned. Okay? So nothing suggested that he would become a great scientist tomorrow. So he was, in other words, a very ordinary kid. A very ordinary kid. Alright? Okay? On, so the contrary, contrary, on the contrary means on the opposite side. In fact, just the opposite. Okay? So just the opposite. His mother thought. Albert was a freak. Freak is somebody who has unusual habits, not the habits of other common people, right? Whose uh, habits, whose behavior is different, whose habits are different from the others. Okay? So such a person is called a freak. And Albert Einstein's own mother thought that Albert Einstein was a freak. Why was he a freak? Because to her, his head seemed much too large. He had a big head. Alright? And it is said, you know, this is often said that people with big heads have more intelligence, are more talented. That's what's usually said. Okay? So his mother thought that he had a too large, you know, a head. And uh, he was uh, a rather freakish kind of a fellow. Okay? He did not mix with other people. He did not mix along with, with, with his friends. And he used to stay alone. So his mother was unimpressed. He was a very, very ordinary kid. Okay? Nobody would have imagined that this kid would someday become such a wonderful, such a famous, a renowned scientist. Okay? Right. Coming to the second point. Albert Einstein spoke up late. He spoke up very late. And he was an introvert. Introvert is somebody who does not easily mix with people, who loves to stay alone. Okay? Such a person is called an introvert. The opposite of introvert is extrovert. Okay? So he was an introvert and he was nicknamed Brother Boring. So he was a boring kid. He was called Brother Boring by the other kids. So, let's do point number two from the book. At the age of two and a half, Einstein still wasn't talking. So he did not speak up even at the age of uh, two and a half. When he finally did learn to speak, he uttered everything twice. Einstein did not know what to do with other children, 
So he would stay alone because he did not know, I mean, what exactly to talk to. Okay? So he stayed away from other children. And the other children, his playmates, that is his friends, called him Brother Boy. That is a rather boring child. Okay? So the youngster played by himself much of the time. He especially loved the mechanical toys. You see, this is, you know, the first sign of his becoming a great scientist someday. Later. Okay? So, you see, he loved playing with mechanical toys. Alright? And looking at his newborn sister, Marja, he is said to have said, fine. But where are her wheels? So you know, she was a baby when she was a baby, the sister. He looked at her and said, well, this is fine. I mean, she is a beautiful girl. However, where are her wheels? That is, her legs were so small that he equated her legs with the wheels of a car and said, where are her wheels? Okay, so this shows how he would think, you know, his thought process. Okay, alright, now let's go over to the third point. Show no promise as a kid, learn to play the violin. So he did not show any promise, a promise of greatness. And he learned to play the violin at a very early stage. Alright, let's do point number three from the book. A headmaster once told his father that what Einstein chose as a profession wouldn't matter because he will never make a success at anything. You see, this is a negative comment. His principal at school told his father that this guy is going to do nothing. Okay, so it doesn't matter which profession he chooses, because he will be successful at nothing. Alright, so this is a negative comment. So you can understand how he was such an ordinary kid. He did not show any promise. Okay, so Einstein began learning to play the violin at the age of six. Because his mother wanted him to. So he learned to play the violin at the age of six because his mother was interested in the instrument and he, she wanted him to learn violin at a very at a very early age. So he picked up the violin, he learned to play the violin and he learned it at the age of six. And he later became a gifted amateur violinist. So amateur, the word amateur A-M-A-P-E-U-R, amateur. Amateur means somebody who is not a profession, who plays or does something as a hobby. So he became an amateur violinist and maintaining the skill throughout his life. And he remained a good violinist, a good violin player throughout his life. Hello everyone. I'm very beautiful. Okay, now, coming to the next He hated school. Good morning to all of you. And because he the atmosphere of the school was very He hated the stifling discipline. Stifling is suffocating. Okay, he feels suffocated. So that is the kind of feeling he had when he saw the discipline in his school and therefore he decided to leave school. Let us do this in detail. Point number four. But Albert Einstein was not a bad pupil. He was a good student. He went to high school in Munich where Einstein's family had moved when he was 15 months old. So Munich, Munich is a city in Germany. Alright, so when Einstein was 15 months old, 
that is one year, three months old. So his uh, parents shifted to Munich, where Einstein's family had shifted and scored good marks in almost all the subjects. Right? So he was not a very bad student in the class. Einstein hated the school's regimentation. Regimentation means the word regimentation means very strict discipline. Very strict discipline. So he did not like the strict discipline. And often clashed with his teachers. Clashed is he often fought with his teachers. Okay? He often opposed his teachers. At the age of 15, Einstein felt so stifled. Stifled is suffocated because of the strict discipline that, that he left the school for good. For good means forever. So he decided not to study in the school in Munich. Okay? Because he did not like the, the very stiff discipline over. Alright? So, coming to the next point. Einstein continued in education in Switzerland, which was more liberal than in Munich. So Einstein decided that he would go to Switzerland to study that. Alright? In a school which was more liberal, which was more open, which was more broad-minded, which was not so suffocating. Right? Like the school in Munich. So in point number five, you see, the previous year, Albert's parents had moved to Milan. Milan is a city in Italy. Yeah. Okay, and left the son with relatives. After prolonged discussion, after a long discussion, prolonged is a very long, after a very long discussion, Einstein got his wish to continue his education in German speaking Switzerland in a city which was more liberal than so he decided to continue his studies in Switzerland and not in German. And in Switzerland, things were more liberal, okay, and things were not so stifling, and he found things to be easy going in Switzerland. Alright, so coming to the next point. Arts and science were his forte. Forte, forte, the word forte means strong points. Strong points. So, maths and science were obviously in strong points at the university in Zurich. Zurich is a city in Switzerland. Okay? Zurich is a city in Switzerland. So, he shifted to Switzerland and he continued his studies there. So, point number six. Einstein was highly gifted in mathematics and interested in physics. And after finishing school, he decided to study at the university in Zurich, which was a city in Switzerland. But science wasn't the only thing that appealed to the dashing young man with the walrus moustache. So he was interested in science and mathematics, but that, that these two subjects were not the only points of interest for this dashing. Dashing is very smart and handsome. Very smart and handsome. Young man with a walrus moustache. Walrus. Now walrus is an animal with two large teeth. Alright? That comes out of its mouth. Okay? So walrus is a big animal. It's too large teeth. Now, walrus moustache means a rather bushy, long and bushy moustache. Thick moustache. So, if you've uh, seen the pictures or the sketches of uh, Einstein, you've seen his bushy moustache, right? He had very thick and bushy moustache. Okay? So, to Einstein, these two subjects were not his only interest. What was his other interest? That, you see, in the next point, when he was studying at Zurich, right, he fell in love with a fellow student, he fell in love with a girl called Mileva Marek. Mileva Marek was a fellow student, 
was his classmate and he fell in love with her. And he, and he found Mileva, this girl, Mileva, to be an ally. Ally is friend. A double L Y. Ally means friend. He found her to be a friend against the Philistines. Now, Philistine, please understand this word. Philistine is a person who does not like music or literature or any other art form. Okay? So, a person who does not like literature or music or any other art form is called a Philistine. Okay? So, what appealed, what really attracted him to Bileva is that Bileva was also keenly interested in music and in literature and also his subject, his favorite subject, which was physics. Okay? So, he found he was against all the Philistines that is, people who did not love art and literature and music. Okay? And he found that Mileva was also against all these Philistines. So, she made a good companion to him. She was a good companion. Why was she a good companion? Because their tastes were the same. Their interests were the same. Alright? So, let us go over to point number seven. He also felt, that is Einstein, also felt a special interest in a fellow student called Mileva Marek, whom he found to be a clever creature, a very intelligent woman. Okay? This young Serb, Serb is a person who lives in Serbia. Serbia is a country in Europe. Okay? So, uh, this young sir, meaning Mileva, had come to Switzerland because the university in Zurich was one of the few in Europe where women could get degrees. Okay? Einstein saw in her an ally against the Philistines, those people in his family and at the university with whom he was constantly at odds. At odds means having differences or when you oppose somebody, you are at odds with that person. Okay? So when you oppose somebody, then you are said to be at odds with that person. Alright? So, Mileva was a person whom Einstein found to be very interesting. And that was because many, not his mother, remember, not his mother, but many people in Einstein's family and also in the university were Philistines, were people who did not like arts, arts and, the, you know, the different art forms and music and literature. So, Einstein did not like such people. He did not like the Philistines. Why didn't he like the Philistines? Because he used to play the violin and he was interested. Even though he was a man of physics, but he loved art and literature and music. Okay? And likewise, Mileva was also interested in all of these. Therefore, he found Mileva to be a good companion. Okay? Alright, the couple fell in love, the two fell in love, letters survive in which they put their affection into words, they were love letters exchanged between uh, the two of them, letters survive, which means the letters are still there, okay, which prove that they put their affection into words, and mixing of science with tendons. So Einstein, all of Einstein's letters to Mileva used to mix science, that is physics, with tendons, that is with love. And uh, Einstein once wrote to Mileva, How happy and proud I shall be 
when we both have brought our work on relativity to a victorious conclusion. So he had written to Mileva once that we would be very proud, I would personally be very proud when the two of us working on relativity, on the theory of relativity, will make this theory a success. A victorious conclusion means we would make this theory a success. So this was the kind of love that Einstein had for Millennium. All right, he used to mix love with science and then write the letters. All right, bring us to the next point. Even while doing the job, he continued working on his own ideas in physics. That is, even while he was doing a job, he kept working on his own, you know, his own theory. Right? So see the next point, point number eight. In 1900, at the age of 21, Albert Einstein was a university graduate and unemployed. He was still unemployed at the age of 21. So he worked small time, he did small time jobs, he worked as a teaching assistant, gave private lessons and finally secured a job and he found a small job in 1902 as a technical expert in the patent office in Bern. Alright, Bern is a place. So he found uh, a, the job of a technical assistant, alright, in a patent office. Now what is patent? Patent is when you have discovered something or you have invented something, a certificate is given to you claiming which would be a stamp of approval on your claim that that invention is yours and nobody else. So it is a kind of certificate certifying, certifying that it is your invention. So nobody else can claim it to be his or her invention. It is your invention and the certificate proves it. So that is called a patent. So he used to work at a patent office, verifying various, uh, you know, inventions and discoveries and uh, uh, kind of uh, verifying whether they were true, they were genuine, they were original. And while doing it, he used to seek work on his own theory. Okay? So, while he was supposed to be assessing other people's inventions, Einstein was actually developing his own ideas in secret. So, while working, while working for others, he was also working on his own theory in physics, very secretly. And therefore, he is said to have jokingly called his desk drawer at the work the Bureau of Theoretical Physics. So where he sat and worked in the office, he used to call it, you know, jokingly, the Bureau of Theoretical Physics. That is, he called it the desk where he developed his own ideas on physics. Got it? Okay, now we come to the last point. In 1905, this was the breakthrough. This was the great special theory of relativity that he came up with. You are all aware of this particular equation. E is equal to mc squared. Alright? So, this is the theory of relativity which he came up with and for which he got the Nobel Prize later. Okay, so one of his, one of the most famous papers of 1905 was Einstein's special theory of relativity, according to which time and distance are not absolute. So time and distance were not absolute, they were relative terms. Relative is comparative. Okay, they were comparative terms. Nothing was absolute. It depends on, you know, your perception, your comparison, okay, and the circumstances. And then you 
kind of you uh, set the value to something. So the value of something would be set according to circumstances. All right. So everything can be comparative, but nothing is absolute. That is his theory of relativity. Indeed, two perfectly accurate clocks will not continue to show the same time if they came together again after a journey if one of them has been moving very fast relative to the other. So he says that two clocks, if they moved at different speeds and then met at a particular point, they would not show the same time. They started with the same time. Please understand this. They started with the same time, traveled at different speeds, met at a point, and showed two different times. Why? Because one traveled faster related to the other. In relation to the other, one traveled faster. One traveled faster in comparison to the other. So therefore, when one travels faster than the other one, they show different times. Okay, so nothing is absolute. Right, that is why it said that time and distance are not absolute. They are comparative. So he came up with the relationship between mass and energy with this particular equation. E is equal to mc squared where uh, M is for the mass, E is uh, the energy, M for the mass, and C for the speed of light in a vacuum. Speed of light in a vacuum, which is about um, uh, 3 lakh kilometers per second. Okay, uh, so that's it. Uh, this particular theory changed the perception of people who till now thought the time and distance, they were absolute but they were not. Okay? They were only relative. They were comparative. Alright? So, uh, that's it. That's uh, all for today. Now, before I go, you see, uh, Einstein had a sense of humor to show what relativity, you know, comparison is that two things differ on a comparative degree or scale. He said something very uh, humorous. He gave him a, a, a humorous example. Now he says at the end, you see, in a little box it is given that Einstein is supposed to have said that when you sit with a nice girl for two hours, it seems like two minutes. When you're sitting with a very beautiful girl, time simply flies by and you think that you've sat with her only for two minutes, though you've sat with her for two hours, right? But, but, if you are made to sit on a hot stove for two minutes, it seems like two hours. And that is relativity. But if you are forced to sit on a stove, which is burning, you are made to sit on it. For two minutes, it will seem like two hours. Because you will be dying to get out of there. Okay? So see how humorously he has described relativity or comparative degree, right? It is all a matter of comparison. With a beautiful girl, time flies and two hours seems like two minutes. On a hot stop, two minutes seem to be like two hours. And he said, said that this is his relativity. All right? So that was his sense of humor. All right, so thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Thank you for listening so patiently. That's all for today. That's the end of part one. Be sure to join me for part two. I hope this part is clear. And we will do part two, the concluding part, the next day. So till we meet again, it's bye-bye.
a very good evening to all the dignitaries parents and students here in the webinar uh, uh, a very happy teachers day uh, we by uh, jai hind everyone and first of all a very happy teachers day to everyone I'm Spriya Singh of Sunbeam School, Jaipur, UP, India, and today I'm present here to give speech on Teachers Day. Guru Govind, do ghade ka ke lagu paaye, balihari Guru apne Govind dio bataaye. Artha, I'm told a very beautiful line that when a child starts doing anything, first thing he does is the action of his taking away from that. 